Welcome to the Dodgers Prospects Podcast, round two, the second edition of the 2022 offseason. I'm Casey Porter of Dodgers Daily. On your screen, you see Tim Rogers of Dodgers 2080 today. So, Tim, thanks for joining. How's it going today, the day after Thanksgiving as we record this? Well, it's excellent. I'm looking, I'm really happy to be back again. Uh, appreciate everyone taking a look at our uh, last podcast. And it was, um, yeah, thanks for all the feedback. And we, we welcome all that feedback and more. No so doubt, you, no thank doubt. You everybody. Had a good audience for the first go round of the 2022 offseason. So excited for today's show. Today, we're going to cover the four players that were recently put on the 40 man roster in anticipation of protecting them from the Rule 5 draft next month. So, basically, what, what happened was there was a deadline that, that you had to put players on your 40 man. If you did not, then the next, in, in December, I believe it's December 7th, there's what's called a Rule 5 draft, and all the other teams can draft your players that aren't on your 40 man. Now, they have to put those players directly on their 26, so it has to be a guy that they think is ready for the major leagues at at this moment. So we're going to talk about the four guys that the Dodgers protected by putting on the 40-man. We're going to start at the top, the Dodgers' number one prospect, catcher, Diego Cartaya. I know you've seen him a whole lot. You have a wonderful interview there on your Dodgers 2080 page, so you've talked to him on several different occasions. You are very high on him. So start digging into Diego Cartaya. Yeah, um, so I did get to meet him in spring training, and then uh, surprisingly he was uh, signed to Rancho again. Um, so uh, it was great to to get to know him a bit, and you know, it, like I said, interview him a few times, have some interactions. Really good, really good guy, mm-hmm. um, straight up. Um, he's a definitely a, a leader. He's got that it factor, um, a lot of charisma, and all that good stuff. You know, very photogenic, as you see. Mm-hmm. I'm taking thousands of pictures of the guy already. Um, knows he's good, kind of like Andy Pa has a guy we're going to talk about today. Knows yeah. he's good, but not arrogant about it. Confident, but not arrogant. Would that make sense? Totally. And the guy works hard. He's one of those guys that you see off to the side doing the extra work. Yep. It's kind of like Freddie Freeman, you know, four hours before a game, he's out working with, you know, doing the little picks uh, at first base. Um, Diego's the same way. And then, you know, at the plate, I mean, the, the, the sound mm-hmm. that, that comes off the bat, you know, that it's, it's just that really precious, just it's just that perfect sound. Um, it sounds different he, than other guys when they take BP. It does. You know, he's a big kid. Um, so behind the plate, he, he, you know, he's not like an Austin Barnes who's, in my opinion, just the perfectly built catcher, you know, the the size. Like Will Smith also. So Diego's taller than those guys. He's about 6'2", maybe even 6'3". Um, he might even still be growing. He's only 21. Um, but he's a big kid back there. 6'3", 219. Yeah, and he might, there might be more. I mean, again, he's only twenty one. He he won't he might not stop. <laughs> um, but uh, he, he's just a big kid, um, and he works hard back there. Um, I think he works well with the pitchers. Fortunately, he had uh, a really good mentor at Rancho in in Marco Hernandez. Mm-hmm. Uh, Marco is a top notch guy, um, and was you know definitely a mentor um, for Diego, and I think helped him get through some things. And, and I think, you know, there's always concerns about um, young catchers. And very few young catchers come in and, and are just dynamic right off the, yeah. the, the top defensively. They may come out and hit offensively, but defensively, we talked about it a little bit last week with us, you know, with uh, Will Smith. You know, they needed Austin Barnes to finish off the World Series yeah. because the, it takes so long for these for catchers to get established. It is the hardest position. And then it wears them down. Kind of to, oh. to go to what you're talking to, if you look at the way that his season ended, he struggled a little bit in August. He hit 236 and then 136 in September. His OPS in September, the last month of the season, was 478. And so for those of you who haven't watched him play, kind of what you're saying, if you haven't seen you know, how he plays on the field and you're just looking at numbers, which a lot of people do, don't do that because, I mean, yeah. that, that is just not fair to the type of player he was last year. You know, he, he split time with Ryan January. Ryan January at Great Lakes. Of course, he started, like you said, with Marco Hernandez. Then he moved up to high A Great Lakes. He had Ryan January there who was just a – Rock solid, great worker. So another guy to work with, and then he, and then when when Ryan got moved up to Tulsa, then he had Cake Rios, who, if you talk mm-hmm. to anybody in the organization, the young man from Hawaii, 
He is one of the most well-respected, well-liked players, kind of like Kenneth Betancourt, if you will. And so he's had just wonderful people, like you mentioned, around him. So when you look at his numbers towards the end of the year, I wanted to get that out there. I wanted to just kind of smush that right off the bat, not to be concerned. I mean, it's of course, he moved two levels. He caught a lot. He's still trying to get his feet underneath him. And so, uh, you know, the, the, the numbers as far as August and September, not something I'm concerned with at all. Would you agree with that? I totally agree with it. And, you know, with the DH in place, they'll, they'll use that more. I yeah. think because this was really, you know, obviously we lost 2020. And then 2021, Diego only played, I think, 31 games. Yes, yeah, because he was hurt. Yeah. So now they wanted to get him as much exposure because they are trying to turn him into, like any young guy, into a – excellent catcher they know the bats there and the bats going to continue to grow but to make him into a better catcher and to be uh you know eventually just in my opinion to split time with will smith um you know with the dh they can rotate um and you know just as a note i did in spring trainings and even a little bit at rancho saw him working out at first base just yeah. as a note. And he did play 95 games this year. And coming off of the 2021 where he was injured, did not get to play a whole lot. Then the 2020 where obviously he didn't play at all, at least in an affiliated organized baseball. Yeah. That's a big ask, 95 games. And yes. he played most of them at catcher. So, so you know, that, that just kind of goes to the fact that he had a big year. He had a big ask of him this year. And then when you stack on top of it, that Great Lakes, they had that – just amazing run there towards the end of the first mm-hmm. half where he was having to catch almost every game. Uh, you know, when I believe the, the Loons were back like eight games with thir- – eight and a half games with 13 to go, and they caught Dayton, and Diego was a big part of that. So this was a big year in 2022. I, I think, you know, the, the Dodgers brass, and, and we talked about this, they don't look at numbers. They look at, at progress mm-hmm. and the progress that – the metrics and the benchmarks that they put out for each individual player. And I think you met every single one of them. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And you'll get to see him this year. I mean, if he's, if he's, I, I, don't, I do not expect him back at Great Lakes. He should be at Tulsa. And who knows, maybe even OKC by the yeah. end of the year. Well, I don't think there's any chance he starts in Great Lakes. And, and the reason that, you know, obviously he's very good and he spent mm-hmm. a lot of time in high A last year. I think the organization wouldn't mind leaving him back in high A just to let him reset a little bit and and not to rush him. The worst thing you want to do to a great young prospect is rush them too fast. I mean, you can set them behind several yeah. years if you throw them through the wolves way too fast. We saw a little bit of that with Gavin Lux at the major league level. Mm-hmm. So I don't think the organization would mind leaving him back from that perspective, but Dalton Rushing made it up to high A Great Lakes in 2022 yeah. for the postseason series that they should have won. Oh, my, they had they had that thing won. They won the first game <laughs> against Dayton and lost the last two. Still disappointing. I talked to Austin Chubb and, and Dave Anderson and Dylan Nashotka all about that, and they were like, oh, man, we thought we had that thing won. But <laughs> I think that uh, he starts in Tulsa yeah. only because, of course, you have Carson Taylor and Ryan January and Chris Betts at Tulsa, too, so that's a log jam there. But it's, so it'll be interesting to see now that I kind of – talking about this i mean you have carson taylor who's a top 30 prospect the young man out of virginia tech who just left-handed hitter he had a season kind of like hartaya had in 2021 where he just couldn't stay healthy and it affected his offense so don't look at his numbers from this last year but i can tell you for a fact carson taylor has a big time hit tool and he has just absolutely tremendously uh, increased his defensive skills as he's gone on in the organization ryan january very talented young man left-handed hitter out of San Jack, originally out of uh, Swamp Scott, very good catcher. And then Chris Betts, who was originally a second-round draft pick that the Dodgers picked up last year, who was also a left-handed hitter, very talented. So then you have those three guys. Wait, wait, there's a note. There, I got a note for you on Chris Betts. Oh yeah, dirt he bike. Retired. Oh, did he really? He did. Yeah, it's one of you know, it's it's in the MILB transaction. Okay, he retired. Well, yeah. I'm glad you caught that then. Yeah. Okay, he's gonna go back to dirt racing, then I'll bet you. That's like his big passion. Oh, is it? I didn't know that. Yeah, no, he has a huge fan base in that dirt racing deal. Yeah, so every time you – Yeah. I can't believe – Yeah, I got to talk to him a couple times, never interviewed him, but did get to talk to him, you know, like, hey, how you doing? And just a couple of moments here and there, but really cool dude. So, okay, so that eliminates one there. And then in Oklahoma City, you have Hunter Fiducia, who was the the young man out of – 
out of uh, Barb High School in Louisiana, then went to LSU Eunice, and then the University of Louisiana State, LSU, and played for Paul Maneri there. Big, tall, left-handed guy, lanky guy who throws down to second base very well. He gets very hot at the plate, smooth swing. So left-handed hitting catchers, you have Hunter Fiducia, Carson Taylor, where you had Chris Betts, Ryan January, and then then you have – you know, yeah, and then behind them you have Diego. The crop behind them is Diego Cartaya and Dalton Rushing, who is, if you didn't see him after he got drafted in 2022, one of the most impressive. Did you see him at, yes. at Ranch? I, he was just way above that Gosh. caliber of hitter by the time he got there. <laughs> it was amazing. Yeah. It, he was, I mean, I, I wish he would start at Ranch next year. He won't. And also, just. I well, he's already at Great he, Lakes, yeah. Yeah, and so he shouldn't go back. And I don't want to leave out. Um, Really, the the people, Yainer the people got a lot with, better this year, didn't he? Yeah, Yainer Hernan, uh, Fernandez is, you know, people would probably die for him. Yeah, the guy's a he's an amazing dude. Yeah. Um, and, a lot of yeah, energy. You, you, you'll love him. He'll remind you of the Austin Barnes type catcher. Uh huh. And he plays second base. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> the Dodgers, man, him. they're loaded at that catcher's position, which is only great for Diego because. You don't have to rush this guy, you know, and, and mm-hmm. also, and I want to bring this up too. of course, the business part of this, these guys are told every day, Hey, you're not just auditioning for the Dodgers front office. You're auditioning for all the other clubs. Every time you take the field odds are, if you make the major leagues, it's probably not going to be at the club that you got drafted by. Right. I mean, those are just the odds exactly. of, of the business transaction. So Diego Cartaya being a big name, of course, you put him on the 40-man roster. That makes him very attractive to other teams if the Dodgers want to go get a starting pitcher or a starting left fielder or whatever they may do, right? Or did I open up a can you don't want to talk about, huh? We can do a whole segment or a whole new podcast on on the trade rumors coming up, and maybe we should. (laughs) Yeah, but he would be the guy, I think, that if you wanted to go get, say, Corbin Burns, yeah. He would be the guy the other team would want. Would you agree with that? Yeah, the, the, yeah, the rumors out there uh, kind of almost are like, no, no, no. I mean, uh, yeah. uh, just to throw it out there, it was out there. that Cartaya, Michael Bush, and Ryan Pepio for Corbin Burns yeah. over my dead body. Yeah. Well, That's I mean, you know, they can only say no, right? I mean, you might as well throw exactly. it out. Of course, if you negotiate high, then if you start high, yeah. then when you negotiate, then you end up yeah. somewhere in the middle, right? We've all bought a car it, before. It, it's Jim Bowden rumors. It's, yep. you, know, you know the type. Which I don't, honestly, <laughs> I don't fun. really like to get into. I know it gets a lot of clicks and it drives people oh, it to your site, but I just, it, first of all, mm-hmm. I, I feel like it in a, a large part, you know, especially with these minor league guys that aren't still aren't making a whole lot of yeah. money yet. I just feel like you're kind of using them for clickbait, if you will. So I, I just try to stay are. away from it. Oh, yeah. It's it's bad. Okay, so yep. there's there's Diego Cartai. Let me yeah. go over some of his numbers. 222, his slash line was 254, 389, 503. His OPS was 892, which was very good. 22 home runs. We talked about it. I got the – you know, I got the elephant in the room taken care of early on. He did struggle the last yeah. two months offensively. We explained why he was hurt in 2021, didn't play in 2020, played 95 games this last year, so obviously worn down for a career. Diego Cartaya, 269. His last line's 269, 38502, OPS 882. And just from a catcher's perspective, the thing, you know, of course, there's always things in the minor leagues that you're trying to get better. I do think he has to improve his defense. He needs to improve his blocking. You've probably seen that with your own eyes. Mm -hmm. And then I think he needs to. Of course, it's very difficult for Dodgers catchers to throw out runners because the pitching guys will just tell you they're not worried about it. They're worried about getting the hitter out of the plate. So it's very hard (laughs) for catchers to throw runners out in the Dodgers system. So if you look at the cot steeding rate, 24% for his career, 23% for 2022. If you want him to be a top shelf defensive catcher at the major league level, that needs to come up to somewhere around 30%. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, um, you said it best. They don't care about that. There, yeah, they there don't. is absolutely no help. Um, any guy that's thrown out, it's almost a joke. It is. Uh, it, 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 the full leg kicks and everything. So there's no slide stepping or anything. And, like and that. there's I get it. And, and this isn't a dig on anybody. This is a yeah. this is a planned you know strategy by yes. the Dodgers organization because metrics will tell them if you get the hitter out, it doesn't matter what the runner does, right? Exactly. Yeah. But yeah, Diego. So straight up. I mean, his throws look good to me. Yeah. Um, you know, just the the bare naked eye. They look really good. They're sharp. 
they're on target. I, I like what I saw. So Quick I'm not release. worried about that. Yeah. Quick release. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Strong arm. I didn't have a stopwatch. Maybe I should do that. <laughs> yeah, his pop time. Of course, it's impossible to find pop times for minor league guys. So we so, probably won't know. You know, maybe if, if we both make it to spring training and we have a stopwatch with us, maybe we can catch one. But I would be shocked if it's much over two probably a little bit over two at this point depending on yeah. the type of pitch and that so hey let's go ahead and move on let's go yeah. let's move on to the next big time Dodgers prospect Andy Pajes I've got to see him quite a bit got to yeah. see him a lot at Tulsa this last year he had a little bit of a down year 234 was his average and his slash line was two well actually it's 236 his slash line was 236 336 and 468 OPS of 804, 26 home runs. If you remember in 2021, he led all of the Dodgers minor league system in home runs with 31. He backed that up this year with 26. The average was a little bit down. OPS, anytime it's over 800, that's good. But, you know, you kind of want a guy in the minor leagues like like Andy Pajas maybe to be up around 900. But so talk about the season that Andy Pajas had. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I, I I think when I think of Andy, I, I think of guys like Dave Kingman. You know, the big swing and miss, lots of strikeouts. Yeah, my comp is Jay Buhner. Oh, good one. Yeah, because he does he, defensively. The guy can play defense. Yeah, he's got a really strong arm, so he's not the one dimensional. But I'm just you know, as a hitter, it's like there, it's going to be a lot of swing and miss. Um, people don't mind that these days, I, I guess. Uh, a lot of fly <laughs> so, balls. Yeah, um, and that's what they want. Um, but yeah, he can, he can actually play a legit center field, um, throw guys out. Um, maybe in the majors, it can be a right fielder. If he's in left field, he's a total asset, um, in terms of, um, defensive play. So, so overall, you like him in left field better than right field? Well, no, because we have that guy named Mookie. Bass. Yeah. <laughs> Which do you think Mookie's going to stay there? Uh, for a, a few more years. Yeah, yeah I, I do. I, I think so. That's, he's so, br- he's brilliant out there. Um, but you know, Pa has any, you know, he could probably play major league center field. I, you know, it'll be interesting to see, but he they have athletic. played him at all three positions to try yes. to, to see if he, if he can profile. I did talk to Austin Chubb, not to cut you off there. We'll get back to your yeah. thoughts here in a second, but his manager, Austin Chubb coached him in, in Ogden 2019. He coached him in the DSL his first year. Mm. Then he also coached him in high A. So he coached him three, his, his first three years in professional ball and, Chubb tried to play him everywhere in the outfield, and Austin Point Blank said he profiles as a right fielder in his opinion. Yeah. Corner outfielder. Yep, no surprise. But, you know, it, it's it's okay to be able to play some center field, that's sure. for sure. Um, but, yeah, I, I the guy can actually run. He definitely has a gun. No doubt. Uh, so that we, we like that type of stuff. So that maybe there's some um, outfield versatility, which the Dodgers like. Um you know, it, it's just a matter of is he going to put enough bat on the ball? I mean, you've seen him. Did you get a chance to go to many Tulsa games oh, yeah. this year? Yeah, I went to okay. several Tulsa games. I, I've seen him live many, many times. And I don't know how to explain it, but it's a different presence. It's it's kind of like you were talking mm-hmm. about with Cartaya taking BP, man. This guy has power that, that strikes fear in the other team. Even when yeah. he's not hitting, you know, it's, he's – He's different, and he knows it. You know, he has that, he has that international swag, if you will. That, yeah. that, like I said, it's not arrogance at all, but very confident. He carries himself with an aura, and man, when he hits it, it stays hit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I got. I, I've only seen him live at, in spring training. Um, yeah, if you can get out there, you get. You're right up there. Yeah, you, you, you're you know just right on the fence when you get a media pass. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's amazing. His arm is underrated. I'm telling you, his arm is good, really yeah. good. Yeah, yeah. No, that's. I mean, I, I haven't seen much of it in action, but from the scouting reports I've read, they say it's really good. So, yeah, yeah. Don't underrate that, folks. It's definitely a right field arm, and I think by the mm-hmm. time I don't think his ETA is next year. I think he's going to probably start in Tulsa again, then end up in Oklahoma City. I think his ETA is 2024, which is perfect timing Mm -hmm. because I think that gives Mookie Betts another year in right field. And then it gives you just kind of time to figure out, okay, how are we going to plug all these other positions? And so I really think Mookie Betts is, as far as his future position defensively, 
is going to be determined on what the Dodgers do at every other position. Does that make sense? So it's going to be determined on do they need a second baseman, you know, do they need a center fielder even maybe or something like that. And that kind of gives them time to sort through all that before Andy Paez becomes an everyday right fielder at the major league level because he is profiled by every single scouting service that you can possibly find as an everyday starting right fielder at the major league level. There's not a scouting mm-hmm. service you can find that, that will not say that about him. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, I mean, to, to have someone scout out as a solid major league type player, that's valuable. Yeah. And he hits a lot of fly balls, which like, you know, I know that's a big thing. And, and check this out in 2021, he hit twice the amount of fly balls as he did ground balls twice. He hit, mm. well, let me get the exact numbers here. He hit in 2021, he hit uh, 20% ground balls and uh, he hit 24% ground balls and 52% fly balls. So that that is over oh. twice the amount of fly balls he did ground balls. Now, this last year in 2022, the interesting thing about it, when his average was down and he didn't hit as many home runs, he hit less than two to one ratio of fly balls to home runs so that was an interesting Mm. stat for me it was almost like it was concerted effort for Andy to try to not hit as many fly balls this last year and I think a little bit of that may have backfired on him I don't know any I don't have any inside information on that that's strictly my opinion just looking at his fly ball to ground ball ratio from 2021 than this last year in 2022 and then seeing just comparing his numbers to that you know because talking to Andy and I, I have you had a chance to talk to him yet? Just briefly. Yep. I didn't have a translator with me. Yep. Well, we actually had one of their trainers at Tulsa there who actually, okay. I believe, I can't remember his name right now. I'll, I'll put it on it as a text whenever I, I do the edits on this. But I actually got trainer of the year at, in AA this year. But when I got a chance to talk okay. to Andy, the first thing he said was, I don't try to hit home runs. I don't try to hit fly balls. I try to hit the ball hard. I try to be a great hitter first. And he said Excellent. that was the first thing he said, and he said it like five different times. And he sold me on it. So very excited about this young man. Good. Yeah, yeah, I like the way he's speaking that into existence for himself, you know, getting the right attitude mm-hmm. and getting the right mindset. That's good. Got to say it again, Andy Pajes, Abreu, if you, if you follow any of right. social media, hot topic, hot name. He, you know, he, he grades out with all the scouts. Another one of those guys that sounds really good in a trade. You know, again, that's another show that we can talk. So it's very smart to put the hot names on the 40 men. They deserve it. Don't yeah. get me wrong. But, it, but it's, very, it's very smart to put the hot names on the 40 man because then that makes them – Way more tradable. Does that make sense, or, or a little bit more? Well, attractive? remember, he was supposed to go in the Ross Stripling trade to the yeah. Angels. Yeah, thank God, man. Yeah, <laughs> it was no doubt. Stripling Jock and and Paez for yeah. It was complex. The trade was more complex than just that. No um, doubt. I, but yeah, thank goodness. So I think so. he's probably going to be a two fifty two sixty hitter, twenty five home run guy, and and play a tremendous tremendous right field for the Dodgers. Kind of a you know, I don't want to he's, – he's got – I think he probably has a better work process and everything around it, but kind of what we all hoped Yasiel Puig might have turned into be for the Dodgers <laughs> a couple of years ago. So Yeah, he's definitely definitely way ahead of, of Puig in the, uh, in, the, in the intangibles. Yeah, in the intangibles. <laughs> okay, so let's move on to Michael Bush. I don't think there are any yes. surprises here. The left-handed hitting pitcher got a chance to talk to Tom Holliday, who – who actually was the coach who moved yeah. him to second base in the Cape Cod League. The comp there is Max Muncie, and he's left-handed, and he hits, and he's a hitter or first type player. I personally think the comparisons in there between him and Max Muncie, I think they're totally different type players, offensively and defensively, but give me your thoughts on Michael Bush. Yeah, first of all, everybody, go look at, at Dodgers Daily – um, from a few days ago where, where Casey did a, seg- a complete segment on Michael Bush. It was excellent. Thank you. Um, so please do that. Um, Michael Bush, I see um, – so, you know, Muncy's you know, he, he's definitely a uh, home run, you know, he, kind of a three outcomes guy, really good at what he does, gets on base really well, um, plays defense – it's ugly, but it's actually effective. I mean, he, he gets better. I think that guy must work really hard at defense because his, if you look at Fangrass, his numbers go up mm-hmm. every year. And he doesn't, even, he doesn't even like third base, but he was, he was competent. Him and JT right, right around the same. 
Um, they were both competent last year at third. But where I see with Bush, the difference is I think we're going to eventually get a guy that's hitting in the 300s. Yeah. That's my that's I my don't see him as a three-outcome guy. I don't either. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, th- I, th- I think he's going to actually hit the ball a lot, a lot with more frequency, um, maybe not quite as many walks. I mean, M- Max Muncy has an amazing eye. Seems like Michael Bush does too, but I think there might be a difference. Um, the power, though, this The year, difference is Michael Bush doesn't swing as mi- and miss as much. So yeah. it, when he goes and attacks a pitch early in the count, Muncy swings and misses on a lot of those, so he puts himself yeah. in a position to walk. Michael Bush hits him, so you're going to get more contact from that perspective. Yeah, and I like that. I mean, he does. He still does strike out a lot, but I think if he wanted to, he wouldn't as much. You know, it's it's more of a philosophy coming from the Dodgers. But he also he tacked on a lot of home runs this year. I mean, he went uh, up to OKC and just started crushing the ball. I don't know if that's the stadium or what. Thirty-two home runs. It's not the stadium. I can tell you that. It's four. 415 to the power alleys and you can ask ryan noda i mean it's not mm. it's of course the pcl is a home run friendly league but not because of mm-hmm. oklahoma city yeah so i think there's there's a lot there and if you can get a a, a guy that plays second base and in my opinion it hits 20 to 25 home runs can hit 280 to 300 gets on base at a you know 350 to 370 clip uh yeah, Brent, ship him. Yeah. <laughs> I'll take that guy. Which he hit all those metrics this last year in 2022. He had 274. Yeah. His on base percentage was 365, and his slugging percentage was 516. He also hit 32 home runs. He was one of the guys. Him, Ryan Ward, and then the next guy we're going to talk about, Johnny DeLuca. All kind of fought it out there for a while, as far as leading the organization in the minor leagues for home runs, and they were fighting Mookie Betts, who ended up leading the entire organization in home runs. And he was one of those guys that, you know, hey, one night it was Michael Bush that was leading the organization. The next night it would be Ryan Ward. And then the night after that it would be Johnny DeLuca. So, yeah. yeah, a lot of home runs for him. And and I've seen him a lot both at North Carolina and then at Tulsa. And then last year in Oklahoma City, he is not a three-outcomes guy. He's one Love of those it. guys we talked about last year week with Bobby Miller with the pitching. Michael Bush has such a good hit tool, kind of like Bobby Miller has such a good fastball. You use the minors to see how he can broaden his horizons. Well, mm-hmm. what is the perfect mix for him? You know, hey, yeah, he could probably hit 320, 330, yeah. but then he's only going to hit six or seven home runs. So is that better or is it better if he hits 280 and 25 home runs? What's the best mix in terms of yeah. what actually helps the team the most? So I think they're still trying to find that, you know, as far as, you know, you hit the benchmarks there a minute ago. Hey, let's see if we can get the 280 range. Let's see if we can get on base somewhere from 350 to 375, somewhere in there. And let's see if we can hit 25 home runs. That would be the perfect case scenario for him. He grew up an all-state shortstop at Minnesota. He also played hockey. He was the quarterback on his football team. I can tell you right now, it may have been ugly when, when he first got started in the Cape Cod League. It is way, 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 way less ugly now. He can move to his right. I have videos all over my social media with it. Yep. He is going to be just fine defensively at second base. Yeah, I, I had a question for you about him. I mean, with the shift going away, yeah, it seems like he could be one of those guys that could spread the ball out if he wanted to. Yeah, you talk. You, you talking about hitting the ball, you know, all different fields to, to beat the yeah. defense because they can't. If oh yeah, no doubt, to. no doubt. Okay, no doubt. He is not yeah. a three outcomes guy. He's, you know, it, if you imagine guys like Tony Gwynn, Rod Carew, yeah. Pete Rose, and I don't thinking. think that I'm comparing him to those guys. Mm-hmm. Those type of Wade Boggs, Don Mattingly, the guys. Freddie Freeman. That, yeah, the, the but the guys that that were always criticized because they hit three thirty, but. But people were like, yeah, but you only hit seven home runs, right? Yeah. But they wanted to hit 330 because that's what they right. wanted to do. That's the situation Mike Bush is in. You know, yeah. I think yeah. he could be an above 300 hitter if he wanted to be. But we know yeah. if you do that, you're going to hit lower line drives. You're going to be looking for exit velocity, which if you if you look at exit velocities, it's easier to hit the ball You know, at a lower, higher exit velocity than is at a higher one. So if you're looking actually just for average – you know, you're, you're not going to hit as many home runs. We all know that. So I think that's what what I was talking about a minute ago. That's that's the yeah. situation that the organization has with Michael Bush right now is that, okay, 
what is the exact metrics we want him to the benchmarks we want him mm-hmm. to hit? We want him to be an above three hundred hitter with less power, or because, like you said, he can do all of that. So this is more of a decision based off of philosophy than it is ability because he can go either way, whichever way the yeah. organization tells him to go. That's what he's going to do. Yeah, and like I said, I I see Freddie Freeman type stuff in yeah. him. You yeah, know, being able to do that. It wasn't it refreshing this year to see a, a, ba- a hitter get up there and be able to sometimes with two strikes go with the pitch and oh, not yeah. just strike out, you know, or pop up. At least have a different to hit approach. an outside pitch, you know. <laughs> At least have a two strike approach, right? Yeah, gosh, which it drives me nuts. <laughs> yeah, doesn't seem like there is one anymore. In baseball, of course, that's a whole other topic for a whole other show, too. Hey, we've got about nine minutes left, so let's get to our last guy, the guy that everybody, other than people who cover Dodgers prospects, were surprised, Johnny DeLuca. And Johnny DeLuca is a young man that has every single tool. Had a chance to talk to him, see him several different times. Got to see him play at Oregon. He is a five-tool guy that can beat a defense in every which way. Great throwing arm, unbelievable range, can steal bases. This guy can do it all. Yeah, um, he's a dude, man. Yeah. I mean, literally, he surfs like he, I saw some great pictures yeah. on Instagram of him surfing. Um, I didn't get a chance to see him that much at Rancho because he was there a bit, but we were also in that whole can't go here, can't yeah. go there because of COVID. And I was trying to scramble for pictures. I only got a, even a few pictures of him. Um, but it's really cool to see him come from from really nowhere to people that don't know about him. Yeah. yeah I mean, to, to people that aren't familiar with the Dodgers. Because I, I took it before we came on to this. I went and looked at some of the prospect lists. He wasn't on any of them. That's why That's why those – <laughs> that's hilarious. Another, <laughs> yeah. I know. The, the only, and well, I'll give credit. Fangrass has him at, had him at 32. Yeah, but well – not on the list. And so it's hilarious to me. 25th round, 2019. And so that ascension, here's what's happened to him. He was yeah. a switch hitter at Oregon. Okay, He hit left-handed and right-handed. That. Yeah. Yeah. And so his left-handed swing, he was kind of that leadoff guy that got on base and slapped the ball here, slapped the ball there. So he decided to ditch the left mm-hmm. side, become a right-handed hitter only. And he did that right about the time he hit the Dodgers organization and started yeah. getting – Great instruction, and all of that hit all at the exact same time. He's always been a world-class athlete. He he, mm-hmm. he trained with, I believe her name is Tiara Davis, the world-class track athlete. Mm-hmm. When he was at okay. high school, he was he was a state champion long jumper. I think they call it the Southern Sectionals. I don't know if it was state champion, yeah. but he won the Southern Sectionals as a long jumper. And so he was a two-sport star. And I can tell you this, with Great Lakes earlier this year, even when his average wasn't good, he was hitting home runs and he was yeah. stealing bases. When he came up to Tulsa, he led the Loons both in stolen bases and home runs. Okay? That's yeah. a mix that you don't find every day in an athlete. Yeah, I really I, – I love the athleticism. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's, that's what makes a team better is when you have a bunch of athletes that also do – you know, can actually apply their skills – but yeah, I mean, I was reading up on him that, you know, he was a, like you said, he was a switch hitter, spray hitter and all that, but he was known for speed. Yes. And then he comes to the Dodgers, they fix all that stuff. He fixes it too, obviously. And all of a sudden you've got a guy that uh, a few years later is on the 40 man roster, has a chance to, to make good. And I, I'm excited about it just to see a guy come from the 25th round. You know, I, I mean, that's always exciting to see and to come from nowhere. I, you know, when he was at Rancho, people are like, who's this guy? You know, it's like, you know, I'm okay, yeah. But then all of a sudden he's gone, promoted. Yeah. <laughs> like, Interesting oh. aspect of his game on June 15th, he was hitting 199, a buck 99. Yeah. I talked to Dylan Ashaka, got a chance to talk to him. I asked him about Johnny DeLuca, and Dylan just smiled. He goes, just wait, this guy's getting yeah. ready to. You know, he he's making all the right swing decisions. He's making hard contact. He's hitting into tough luck. But he's doing everything right to play. He goes, just wait. This guy's getting ready to get after it, and you're getting ready to like what you see from this guy. And I'll be darned from that point on. Johnny DeLuca was just unbelievable. He hit 282 in June. Then he hit 294 in July. Then he hit 316 in August. And then, unfortunately, he got injured to end the year, so he didn't get to play from August 6th on. So uh, I found that interesting. It just kind of goes to show 
what the Dodgers personnel see versus like mm-hmm. the scouting, the the prospects list. They know. I mean, he was hitting a buck exactly. ninety nine, and I can tell you right now, his hitting instructor, his hitting coach with Great Lakes was like, "Yeah, just wait. This guy's got the full package, and he's getting ready to show it." And he was absolutely one hundred percent correct. Yeah, I mean, and it, and it just shows that you know when they, when they build these prospect lists, I mean, they're interesting to me. I like to see they're the fun. information, but. At the end of the day, these are people, they don't have a chance to watch these guys that much. So they're actually, you know, reading off each other and taking, you know, making a phone call here and there. And, and, and DeLuca is a guy that obviously slipped through their cracks, but the Dodgers knew what they were doing. Again, they promoted him fast last year. Um, you know, again, he was a guy that came up 20, you know, drafted in 2019. He actually played with a guy that uh, played with my son in high school mm-hmm. um, at, or- at Oregon in uh, 2019. But then, you know, 2020 hits. He starts 2020 at Rancho. So he's one of the, he's kind of older already, mm-hmm. but they promoted him quick. And they don't, they don't mess around. If they like a guy and they believe that he's ready to go, they're going to promote him. To not go to your point, rule. he was hitting 245 on the day he got promoted. Yeah. So it's like, oh, he's killing it, but they see something. And the age, the age always factors into that. If he was 21 at the time, maybe they don't promote him. But he was probably, what, 22-ish already. He's 24 right now, so he was – I don't know what his birthday is. He was born in in, – so he was 23 at the time when he got promoted, yeah. Mm -hmm. Getting ready to turn 24 the next month. Yeah. So that's – yeah, that's the way it is, you know. And um, the, the Dodgers know. And so we got to, you know, they they're, they're, they are truly one of the top organizations in player development. They've got the eye. Mm-hmm. Um, that's hard to do. And it's not just a bunch of old old scouts sitting there with their cigars. It's 25-year-old dudes out there and dudettes. I mean, it's amazing. You know, you start hanging around the Dodgers, you go, oh, who, you know, you start, I start introducing myself, who's it's a scout and this and that. It's pretty cool. Yeah. But they're, they take – a lot of different, you know, people, and they make them into a team that knows how to develop players and and find them first and foremost. And they do it without smothering the players and making the players feel like robots. Right, and that and people think that because the Dodgers are so quote analytical. Yeah, At the end of the day, you still got to go swing the bat. But they use the yeah. analytics in a different way for every player to mm-hmm. maximize. It's not like they make every player the same player with right. a certain set of metrics. They they use the analytics to maximize each player for what they do. So important. Yeah. That's so important. Every player is different. Every player has got strengths and weaknesses. They're using the analytics yep. to bring out the strengths and yep. minimize the weaknesses for that individual no player. Doubt. All right. Got about a minute and a half. Final thoughts. Um. Very excited about this group. I mean, my goodness, I, I think we have at least in this group alone two future all stars, maybe more. Um, so yeah, this is these are the people that we've been excited about for a while. Um, and now we'll see what happens uh, during this season with the spotlight even a little bit even more on them now. No doubt about it. Cartaya Pajes, DeLuca, Michael Bush. That is an extremely talented group of four players that the Dodgers decided to protect. Dodgers know what they're doing. They chose to protect those four young men, and so they will not be eligible for the Rule 5 draft. So, hey, thank you, Tim. I appreciate you joining for the second edition of the 2022 offseason.